that's real good. Okay, um, I'm going to introduce Stephen. We're going to get started. Uh, there'll be more people joining us, I'm sure. Um, uh, before we're, we're done here, we're going to start with uh, Stephen Morrison of Morrison uh, Woodworking down in Mountain Rest, South Carolina. And uh, I've worked with Stephen now for four or five years, and he has become uh, one of my favorite people in the world. A great guy, uh, really, really uh, helpful and uh, supportive guild member. And uh, he's uh, recently been working on his shop and improving his shop. And so he'll have some things to show us. Although uh, a couple of days ago, he, he sold his uh, wood miser to um, Marcus Briggs Cloud of uh, Egan Y Felicia. So we won't be able to see that wood miser, but I think you'll probably have a new wood miser to show us. So that'll be fun. But uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Stephen, and see how that goes. Hopefully it'll go well enough. Can everybody see us and hear us? Um, all right, so I got Ben Loveland with me. He's a shop manager and, uh, and, and designer for us now. Um, and we're at, at what I guess we call our new shop. Um, for a bunch of years, we worked about five miles down the road from here um, in a shop that's basically in my front yard. And while it was a nice little timber frame shop, it was we had a working space of about 22 feet by 32 feet, um, which was lovely for one or two guys. But once we, we grew a little bit, put more people in there, it got pretty tight and crowded. Um, we couldn't get a forklift in, so every timber had to be had to be rolled in on a rolly cart. Um, we couldn't get a, a tractor trailer up to the to the shop, so we had to unload at the road and then uh, and then shuffle it all in in pickup truck loads. So it was pretty tough. So about seven years ago. Um, we found we found this new shop that we're at, which is which is just right up the road from us. Um, and looking back on it, I don't know how in the world we ever survived in the old shop. Um, seems a bit ridiculous that we even tried. Um, but anyways, I'm going to flip the screen around so I can start showing showing our place. All right, so here we're in. We're in downtown Mountain Rest, South Carolina. This is pretty much the entire skyline of Mountain Rest. Um, this was the shop that we bought. Um, it was built in 1960 um, as an apple packing plant, which is what the, the industry around us was. Um, and it's now kind of shifted more into a little bit of, of tourism. Um, not a whole lot going on here. Um, so we moved out of the shop that, that was ex exceptionally small into this space, which seemed big at the time. Um, it's, uh, it's 50 by 60. And then we enclosed the back porch on it, um, which gave us a, another 10 or 12 feet. So it's roughly 50 by 70. Um, at our original shop, when we unloaded a tractor trailer, we like I said, we had to unload at the road and shuffle in. So it was basically an eight hour process um, for, uh, for at least three guys. And the first time we unloaded here, it took one guy to, about 20 minutes to do it. And we just couldn't even fathom the difference at the time. Um, so we got big sliding doors in the front coming in here. Um, Mac just mentioned that we uh, that we just sold our our sawmill to uh, to the Native American tribe that we've all been working with over in Alabama, and this is what we replaced it with, which is a Cook's sawmill in HD thirty two, and we can cut a thirty two inch log. Um, we can really only cut a cut a twenty eight inch wide cut, but we can start with a thirty two inch log theoretically. Um, we can cut 28 feet long. Um, and while it's on wheels, um, we don't actually intend to use it as a portable mill. Um, it's electric. And so we've got 
a separate electric hydraulic pump over here um, that runs everything. And it's been a huge upgrade for us. We do a lot of resawing of antique timbers and um, we buy a lot of rough cut timbers that we'd like to fine tune ourselves. We use it for cutting a lot of backing angles, um, funny shape posts if we're doing uh, if we're doing an octagon or something along those lines. And then we added a door over here with some outfeed tables so we can slide the the slab wood and the and the offcut timbers outside. So this is kind of the view of the main part of of the shop we bought up here. Um, and again, when we bought it, we thought it was about the biggest thing in the world. Um, and we, you know, like everything, we quickly, quickly outgrew it. We've got a tool room over here that we've got a separate door we can lock. So if someone's gonna steal our tools, they gotta break through at least a couple of different, couple of different uh, lines of barriers. And we keep pretty much all of our regular shop tools on these small scaffolding carts. And so we try to have one set up for each guy. So you got a mortiser, a seven and a quarter, a 10 inch, a 16, a sander, a planer, router, a couple of different routers, some cordless stuff. So everybody can, can move a cart to their, to their spot where they're working. Um, when we first moved in here, all the all the walls were were uh, just plain rough cut boards, and the ceiling was just plywood. And it, we had a huge lighting problem; made a huge difference when we just came in and painted the whole thing white. Um, really brightened everything up drastically. I'm guessing no one cares too much about seeing the inside of the bathrooms. They're about as bad as you might imagine. Uh, Ben's office is in there. Um, it's where he sits and does most of his design work or watches YouTube videos, whichever he prefers. Um, so the property that we bought is, uh, is essentially, it's, it's pretty much exactly one acre. Um, it's a perfect rectangle. Um, and we got it, when we got it, it had this building up front and then in the back, everything out here that you're looking at now was just an open grassy pasture, which we pretty efficiently turned into a giant rutted out mud pit full of stacks of timbers and tarps that were blown off and all kinds of a mess. So it took us a while to, to get around to doing it, um, but we finally built a new shop. Feel free to chime in. Um, we finally- You're doing a great job. About, about Three years ago, I guess, we, we started down the road of, of building this new shop back here. We cleared out all the grass and put down gravel. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble with this thing that Eric talked me into buying. Um, and we looked at a whole bunch of different options for, for what to build and how to build. And of course, we would have loved to have just built a big timber frame building but that was a bit out of our time and and price tag we thought about doing um like a regular metal building or a morton building or something along those lines um and we just really wanted to do something that was that was just a bit different um and so what we came up with was pouring a big slab 60 by 100 and we put a storage container um, in each of the corners. Well, you can hear it right there, but each corner has a, an eight foot by 40 foot storage container or shipping container. Um, and then on top of the shipping containers, we put up timber plates and then set conventional trusses on top of them. So inside, we've got 46. 
um, which is for us a huge amount of space. Um, in the truss design, we put a six foot overhang on each side so that we'd have room to stack stuff that we should probably just get rid of anyways. Um, um, Steven, can I interrupt you? You cut out at, at some point, maybe just for me, but maybe for others too. You said it was 46 by what? Uh, the, the slab is 60 by 100. So the inside space between the containers is roughly 46 by, by 100. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry if our internet gets a little questionable. We actually just got it moved back here to this back building um, on Monday of this week. And so at the moment that the, the shop is just to open, you know, open air space. Um, we don't really have, have any big issues with, with rain so much, but when we have really like wet misty weather, we get a lot of, a lot of settling and dew in here, which has been a little bit frustrating. Um, but, uh, you know, for us in this climate, um, you know, we only have a handful of days in the winter that are, that are too cold to reasonably work outside. And so on those days we go back to the other shop. Um, in the summer between the, the breeze that we get blowing through this thing and the mass of the concrete, it actually stays quite pleasant through, through most, most of the hottest of the summer days. Um, so the containers, so we got four containers that are, that are basically eight foot by 40 foot. Um, so we've got one that's primarily, um, ladders, scaffolding, stuff like that. Um, we've got one that's mostly lig, uh, rigging and, and lifting equipment. Um, the one over here on the front left, back there behind those timbers and the forklift, um, our intention is to turn that one into a tiny house because we, we have a lot of uh, itinerants and, and interns that come work with us and we always have a hard time finding a place to house them. And so, um, so our thought is that we could turn that into a little apartment. Um, we had to Initially intended for the, the containers to house all our regular daily tools. But what we found, let me swing around here. What we found was with our, our little scaffolding tool cart set up, that lip coming up into the container, which is about six or eight inches, is kind of a pain in the butt to, to get to roll stuff in and out of. And so, the rear on the left where Ben is headed, um, we just framed that in. <clears throat> and we're gonna, working on putting a door in there. And so we'll have a lockable tool storage space there. Um, and that's honestly about it. That's pretty, reasonably small shop, but it's given us some room to spread out. Um, we, can, we can separate out and, and work different jobs in the front shop and the back shop, which, is, which has been quite nice. Um, the concept behind the trusses that we set on here was that that middle section, you can see we've got Advantech up there, and that's actually a floor rated truss. So in the, if any necessity arises that we need some more office space, we can uh, figure out a way to put a set of stairs up there and have uh, some <clears throat> office space because that's and uh, and so like I said before we we've essentially consumed every inch of our one acre um, but we were recently Stephen, you might have moved out of Wi-Fi range. I'm in there. 
and a house up there. So now we do theoretically have a little bit of room to spread out if we have to. Um, Stephen, I, I didn't catch what you said there. You, you kind of like walked out of range or the Wi-Fi cut out on you. So you said you consumed every every square inch that you, of, of your space and then you solved the problem how? Uh, we we were able to to buy three acres next to us. Oh, fantastic. let me see if I can get in a better spot. So now we we don't really we don't to expand out there, but at least now we've got the option if we need to. Hey, Stephen, just because I suspect it's on everybody else's mind, and I, I apologize for being gauche, but um, what do you think you got invested in this slab up through the, up through the, uh, you know, through the the roof on this, you know, because it about looks, 150. Yeah, so so that that's a heck of a shop for 150, it seems. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's you know, it's it's hard to compare apples to apples because if we had, if we had built a metal building, you know, fully enclosed and insulated, you know, it'd be a, it'd be a bit different. Um, you know, this being open air, there's certainly some, some, you know, some cost savings there, but, um, but we, we felt like it was a pretty, you know, pretty inexpensive way to get to the, the amount of space that we currently have. Um, and everybody, you know, I think pretty much everybody on the crew is pleased to feel like they're working outside, even when they're inside the shop, you know, it's nice. And there's nice breeze that blows through here. Yeah. This um, is one of the nicer spaces on the that we've ever actually worked in the the containers we spent about 16 grand on the containers um and about half of that was the modifications that we had done to them um the uh having these these roll-up doors added and we've got some walk-in man doors on on some of them um that just about doubled the cost of you know just buying a plain shipping container you know, uh, my hero, Sandy Bennett, did, did build a butler built type building for like $25 a square foot. And S Stephen, that's, that's about what you've got in this. And this has got a lot more charm and character, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's certainly got character. I don't know about charm. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, you know, we, we live in a community full of some really weird, weird folks. Um, and so we, we kind of felt compelled to do something that was a little bit weird. Um, to help us fit in a bit better. Um, and everybody loves it. We've gotten great feedback from the community. They, they all seem to think that it's a, you know, pretty, pretty interesting structure. We've almost always got at least one camper on property with itinerants and, and part-time workers camping out and living here. We felt the need to, to at least do something to kind of brighten up the front of the shop. So I'm sure everyone can recognize a, a faux timber frame when they see one, but we've uh, we just wanted to throw some timber up so guys from the road can drive by and something to catch their eye. So far, it's worked, but I'm not sure if it's a good thing. How did that engineer out? Uh, <laughs> wonderfully. That was a little South Carolina redneck engineering for you right there. <laughs> so, Stephen. Um, you know, having finished the project, you know, knowing what you know now, is there anything you'd do differently on that addition? Well, of course, I'd make it bigger if I could, but we were maxing out the entire space of the property. Um, so that wasn't really, um, <clears throat> wasn't too much of an option. Um, but now, honestly, you know, given given what we had budget wise, um, and what our goals were, you know, at the moment, I'm I'm pretty pleased with what we came up with. You know, now that we put these timber racks, they're like Home Depot style timber racks in here on the side. Um, we've kind of eaten up another five feet on either side of the building which has constrained our space just a little bit so again i wish i had more space um but now at the, at the moment we're, we're we're pretty happy with it the biggest biggest weather issue we have is um you know driving rain doesn't really cause us any trouble but when we have a really heavy 
misty, dewy kind of day, it will halfway through the, the shop, it will look like it had rained, but it's really just condensation. Um, and so I think at some point we're going to have to face the reality of closing this end in the far end is, uh, is no big deal. We're probably going to put a big garage door down there because we don't really have a whole lot of access anyhow. So closing that side isn't a big deal, but closing this side, we really want to keep it as open as possible. But at some point we're probably going to have to have to do something. And then we tried to keep this space as open as possible between the two buildings so that we can, you know, we, we can pull our, our vehicles out of the way here and we can easily get a tractor trailer in to load and unload and all that. And hey, Steve, Steve. It's rated for an, a larger truck like that to pull in. So if it is a downpour and we have to unload a truck, we can drive the truck straight into the shop and unload in the dry. We've got a couple of questions, Stephen, for you. Yep. Um, from Chuck Bolt Boltman. He's in Michigan, an architect in Michigan. Stephen, he says, I did the same thing in a smaller scale for a farm here in Michigan. Do you have a frost footing under the slab? Do you get frost? Not sure exactly where you are in South Carolina. Um, we're, we're in the very north, uh, northwest corner of South Carolina. Um, and we don't really have a, fl a frost issue. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen anything that said how deep we needed to go. These things went pretty deep because part of it was, was on a bit of old fill. And so we had to kind of make, we had to make the footers and the slab a bit bigger to compensate for that. But frost is definitely not an issue for us. We've got a second question here from John Walker, John, Johnny Walker. From John Walker, would a crane <laughs> rail down the middle help move bents around? It, it certainly would, but um, but my guess is it would, you know, I, I mean, I guess it would have to be a completely freestanding crane, but we've definitely thought about that and talked about it, but I don't think it's something we could suspend from the trusses, so it would have to be its own, be its own separate structural system. And, and um, Todd Herzog um, suggests, and I had this idea as well, but um, I think he knows what he's talking about. He might want to look at the aircraft hangar doors uh, for the shop. They make some roll up fabric ones that might work well. I think the, the idea of fabric, uh, roll up fabric is a really good idea for the limited amount of time you need it. Yeah, we've actually had that suggested to us. Yeah, I feel like John Miller maybe was the one that suggested we look at that. But yeah, somebody, somebody has previously told us to look at aircraft hangar doors and uh, I'm sure we will at some point, but it we hadn't gotten around to it. Those roll up fabric ones go up and down in you know less than ten seconds. It's amazing how fast they are. That's a good idea. And and so the tools get wet, Stephen, huh? If if you get that misty rain. No, no. The tools can get packed away either inside a container. In fact, right now we're we're kind of going through the, the growing pains of having to uh, move the tools into the shipping containers um but once we get a lockable door on the space on the the left side where the the door is you know, over there where the zip zip wall is there's going to be a, a a lockable door there and that's our that's our tool room where everything will roll in and out of uh, ben i meant um i meant like if you were working out there in the shop and you got that sort of rain coming down. It not only get yeah. the timbers wet, we get all those, all the tools kind of moist. Yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, that's you can for sequester sure. yourself away from the majority of it, though, for certain. Yeah. I might have something to add about uh, garage doors. Um, can you guys hear me? I'm not sure. Yeah, if, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, uh, Dennis from Benson's, and uh, we built a couple of shops with 20 foot garage doors and we made the mistake of not you know we thought we, we should have gone with the Cadillac doors because the 20 footer is really a 12 footer that's been you know inflated and and so the uh, it really wasn't it gets repaired all the time 
So I really like the idea of the roll-up doors in 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 your in your fabulous shop there, <laughs> Steve. I gotta say that 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 would be if if I had to make that choice again, uh, I would I would do that for us anyway. Some feedback on doors. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Yeah. Any other questions for Stephen? All right. Hey, Stephen, how's that gimbal working? <laughs> it's it's working well. <laughs> <laughs> took a bit of farting around and a couple conversations with you and a couple YouTube videos, but it's it's working great now. How many drinks have you had? Uh, I'm on my second. <laughs> May not be the I I know that uh, you know. I'll be okay if you just have a uh, a ladder going up to that to that loft space for a while until you get that staircase built eventually. <laughs> yeah, we've all done it. the The staircase seemed like a great idea until I tried to lay out how big a staircase it takes to go sixteen feet. <laughs> and it's half the shop space. Yeah, yeah, it eats about half half the shop. So I'm not sure how we're going to negotiate that particular that particular issue when it when it comes up it'll definitely be an exterior set we can guarantee ship ladder is the way to go <laughs> yeah the one the one issue that we really struggle with in the summertime is the um the moisture and the, just the, the basic humidity that we deal with here and we have in the works we haven't we have them we just haven't installed them yet but we bought four of the uh big ass fans to, to run in the shop here to maintain some airflow. Um, they'll go up there somewhere. Yeah, four of them right down the middle to keep airflow going. Great idea. Any other questions for Steven? Would he consider an elevator to get uh, the uh, upper level ask him in 20 years <laughs> <laughs> yeah we thought about it i was actually thinking we could use one of our old roustabouts and and, and just make a a redneck elevator <laughs> well you got a forklift there <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> that's how we've gotten up there in the past yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think it was a really creative solution, and uh, I'm really impressed. I think you guys did a great job, Stephen. I'm sure others feel the same way. And thank you very much for for taking us uh, through your your shop and and checking hey. out checking out that gimbal for us. Yeah, and I Stephen. I also want to I also want to say thanks to Fire Tower for doing the engineering for us. Stephen, there's one question, uh, real quick. Uh, how many people are working at more sudden timber framing right now? Seven. We've got, we've got seven joiners plus myself. And then if you count Steven, two office staff. I wouldn't count me. I'm kind of <laughs> useless. Many of you already know that well. <laughs> and then at any given Not moment, true. we'll have at least three guys on site somewhere. Yeah, the uh, business name is Moore Sun, M O R E S U N, work, woodworking. You yeah, might have we're figured. We're going by Moore Sun Timber Frames now. Oh, okay, Moore Sun Timber Frames. Yeah, too many guys stopping in wanting us to build uh, epoxy tables. <laughs> hey, Stephen, right. when you. And here, here's our big battle right now. It'll do. Yeah, blue stain. Mm -hmm. In this case, it doesn't really matter. The client doesn't care about it, but it's uh, it's definitely a big issue for us down here in the summer. Hunter, you going to ask a question? Yeah, I had a question. Um, when you started off as like a one-man shop, were you doing timber frames or mostly furniture? Got mostly drywall and pressure-treated decks. How'd you transition the, from that to timber frame? <laughs> the, the, 
the theory when I started out was that I wanted to be able to do furniture, cabinetry, timber frames, whatever came up. I had a little bit of a background and and all. Happened that over time, we just fell into more and more timber framework. And it's, it's really, really hard to compete with, you know, with other cabinet shops. Um, because that's all they do and they're very well set up for it and they're much more efficient than we are um so we still get to do a bit of furniture and a bit of cabinetry usually when it's something that's so weird no one else will touch it um but we, or a client wants something to kind of match their frame yeah we, oh. we do a fair bit of cool. pieces of furniture to kind of match what they have but we just found that we um it, it was it was too hard to do as many different things as we really wanted to do. And so we kind of just settled into chasing timber framework more than anything else. Cool. Thanks. Okay. I'm, I'm in the interest of time and uh, to, John Miller runs a pretty tight schedule, it seems. And uh, I want to make sure that, that um, everybody here is going to stick uh, through John Miller's tour. So we're going from the Southeast. Oh, first off, thanks. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Really, it, it, was a, it was a great pleasure to see you again and, and a great pleasure to see the shop. Yeah, you're welcome. It's good. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. We were, we were glad to get to do it. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. But I'm still going to come down there and see you. So it's because you put it on the tour, you know, on the shop tour. Doesn't mean I'm not going to come down and see you. So you didn't get out of that. We got a spot for you anytime you come. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, so we're going to go from the southeast yeah. to the other the other side of the country, all the way about as far away as you can get in, in the Continental Forty Eight, um, and and go to the northwest and visit uh, visit with John Miller of Cascade Joinery. Uh, Cascade Joinery has been around for a number of years. It's it's very well known for its design uh, and and for the work that it does. Uh, John has been a big, big supporter of the guild. He's been the president, the treasurer, secretary, you name it. John served many years on the board and has uh, worked on all sorts of committees, just like Stephen has. And, um, uh, but he's a big, big supporter of the guild and a big supporter of the, of the apprentice training program. And, um, and, and I think um, we'll have an opportunity to be talking about that in the upcoming weeks, the apprenticeship training program. Um, so that's not the topic for tonight, but I do want to commend John um, on his uh, business model, which uh, suggests that he really does need to have really qualified people to do the work that's doing. So John has a, a different approach to that. And it's, when you get a chance sometime, you might want to sit down and talk to him about it. But tonight we'll, um, we'll, uh, we'll visit with John out in, um, geez, John, you're out in Ferndale. Is that right? Or, or are you in... Yeah. Not, yeah. Yeah. You're in we're Ferndale. In, we're in Ferndale. Ferndale yeah. Bell, Bellingham, Just north of Bellingham. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're 10 miles north of town. So in the little town of Ferndale or near it anyway. Yep. Um, so I've never done this on my phone. I always do it sitting at a desk. So I need to hit share screen. Yes. Is that what will Okay. I think that'll work for you. All I'm right. Open. Screen. Uh, you have to choose the screen. Uh, hmm. I don't John, know. John, you might just uh, hit anyway, the, use the other camera on your phone. Yeah, there like that? Yeah. Now, can you guess? Yeah, now you can see. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I did have a lot of notice. Mac told me, asked me. On Monday. So yeah, we rent, we have a pretty nice Hey, hey John, I think you're a little bit far uh, from the Wi-Fi. We're, we're, you're, you're breaking up a bit. I am. Yeah, and, and part of that, about 15 by 40 of that is an office. We have uh, four people in the office, uh, project manager, me and sales guy and an admin person who's part-time. Um, we use the loft up there for storage, uh, um, 
about 50% junk stuff we ought to throw away and the other 50% extra fasteners. Um, we keep all our tools. We, you know, we don't use a lot of complicated tools. We have a, a pretty good selection of the standard portable power tools. Um, and they're all back here, kind of everything has a place. We uh, do some lean kind of try to five S stuff and keep it, you know, more visual. This is our kind of power tool area. These, recently we've started um, finishing, doing more finishing than we used to do. Um, these are eight by 12, 16s that are uh, purlins for a project that we're working on now. It's gonna go to Alaska next summer. I was going to go this summer, but the guy's primary business is taking people off of cruise ships and um, showing them around. And uh, obviously, he doesn't have much going on right now. Uh, John, yeah, so, why, why, why are you doing a lot more finishing, do you think? Because people want it. <laughs> people, <laughs> people are willing to pay for it. So, yeah, so we, these are all sanded to 100 grit. We won't use anything but low VOC water-based finishes or uh, the citrus based finishes like um, heritage cells. You know, these are these are, units are about 1500 bucks a piece to find six inch orbital sander with the uh, dust collection, but they do pretty good. We're getting ready actually to install some air circulation uh, dust collection because it's just really hard to get the fine dust out of the air. Um, we also use this, this is actually a floor sander that has had the handles taken off and we use, we can set it up on on the timbers and use that floor sander and it's got uh, you know it 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 takes off wood a lot faster than anything else we've tried to use we typically don't have this much wood sitting around the job going to alaska is about 40,000 board feet and because job sites in the state of washington were shut down for almost two months because of the COVID virus. We've got some other stuff that's backed up here. Um, just kind of these we keep, we use a bunch of clamps. We keep them kind of organized on these rolling benches here. This is our other bay. This is 80 by 60. And uh, these are the rafters for this project going to Alaska. They are 10 by 20. Uh, they're RFB KD. These are boxed heart, and we had Frazier Wood kerf them before they dried them to try to minimize the checking on the surfaces. And if you can see, it worked pretty well. Oh, it's really Tip beautiful. It's beautiful yeah. material, John. Yeah, typically we, we work, 90% of the work we do is uh, for RFBKD Select Free of Heart Center. Um, and we only go to box tart when we have something really big like this. But you can see when you kerf it, it's amazing how little checking you'll get if, you, if they're kerfed on an, if you can hide a surface. This is the one of the, this is the rafter tail. And the posts are 12 by 22s, and this is the slot. This, this sits down on the post right there. The top of the rafter is on the bottom. This is a brace mortise. The braces are 8 by 12s. And that double step. And uh, this is the collar tie. With the, You can see where the tension rod, the steel rod, is going to go through for the collar tie. And this Why didn't is the you tenon that, at the top. That timber, the, John. Uh, we did. Oh, you did. It's on the bottom. Okay. That's the top. Yeah, nice. they're all curved. All the rafters are. Yeah. Um, so, you know, our shop is kind of modest. It does. There's not really, we don't have a lot of fancy stuff around. We got a lot of talented people. And um, this, we lease this facility. We, we used to own a building, but um, at this point, we just lease this facility. So we haven't spent a lot of money fixing it up. We do have some expensive MyFell tools. I'm convinced the label that says MyFell is $3,000. But the tools are really nice and we use a lot of them. This is Slaughter, which we use a lot. We don't do much traditional joinery out here in seismic zones C and D. Um, 
almost everything we do has hidden steel in it. Um, we do have, this is our, we just finished a job that had a lot of round log work in it or turned poles, not really logs. And we have this big lathe that we made and we use it. We can actually turn, uh, not very fast, but we can turn some stuff on that. And we've got, so we got a motor, I don't know if you can see here. Sorry, I'm not much of a cameraman. And this picture that I'm looking at is so small, I can't hardly see it. So yeah, this is just so we can very slowly turn the timber. And then this is the tool carriage that, that rides back and forth and we can move uh, different, uh, we can put mountain mortisers or whatever saw on there to, uh, so we can always index off a of center, you know, so everything is indexed off of the center of the pole. And then we have known heights above, um, above, I don't know. Now I can't see my screen. I mean, can you guys see my screen now? Mm. No, we see your, your background. Or at least I see your background. Yeah, no, that's that's no, the could, water, could that's Ken, the water somewhere Ken else. Stop, if Ken would stop sharing his screen. Ken yeah. Gordon. Ken Gordon. Let's see if I can figure that out. Ken, are you there? John, you can also share your screen again. Try doing that. I tried that and it said it wouldn't do it. It says you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. I wonder how that how Ken got started. I'm looking for Ken now on the uh Okay. Ken, let's see if I can shut down Ken's thing. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, there are some questions <laughs> that folks have for you. Uh here we go. Ken Ken um you're uh, you're muted, Ken. Um, Was that a Zoom bomb? Is that what they call that? Yeah, you can boot Ken and just uh, he he can sign in again if he's really meant to be on the call. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what I did. Uh, you. <laughs> Sorry, Ken. All Come right. Back, John. Okay, if everybody would mute and John can share his screen. Then we'll be back on. And I, John, I do have some questions for you when you're focused to answer them. Hello, hello, John. You there, John? I'm here. Okay, Thanks. fantastic. All right, All right. I, do have, I do have some questions fr from, the, um, from the audience, John. You, okay. Could you take those? Are you sure. ready for them? Um, yeah. First off, a comment. Kyle Murphy to everybody. This probably re regards the uh, previous one. I just want to make sure to get this information out. But Kyle, Kyle Murphy suggests that UC Coatings has a product they claim works for blue stain, but he hasn't tried it yet. So that's good information. Um, I think Barb to um, Barb to um, to you, John, is like, what woods, what woods do you work with, uh, John, in the Northwest? Um, it's uh, I'd say 90 to 95 percent fir, and then the rest of it's cedar. You know, uh, yellow cedar, Port Orford cedar, or red cedar. All, all great materials. All great materials. Um, John Walker asks, "What are the the most popular finished colors these days? Dark, light, pickled, or natural? What are you finding from people that are most asking of, you to do?" Most of what we put on is clear. Um, some some stains we use mostly uh, Sanson products or this other uh, Malexi, which if I can find it here it is. This is Malisi. This is what we're putting on this frame right here. Yeah, low VOC water-based products. Um, this is called Malisi's waxy finish. We're putting two coats on in the shop, and they'll apply a third coat um, on site. Are you protecting against anything for this particular um, frame, John, or is that it's interior and they, but they just want it, that sort of a finished uh, color? Yeah, it, it's all, it's interior. Most of it's interior. It has one corner of it has a porch and a big cross gable. That's for 48 feet outside of post, outside, outside of post with five feet of overhang outside of that. Um, and it's a uh, hundred feet long, I think. It's a big building. And it has a big snow load. It's uh, up near Denali. 
up near Denali in Alaska. Uh, I think 80 pounds snowed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Barb, Barb asks, um, is there a prominent style of timber framing in the Northwest, John? This forklift is, <laughs> we have two, two very old forklifts. John, can you hear me? I don't know. I can't hear what's being said. Maybe I'm too, get to walk too far from my wireless. So I'm just going to echo. So I'm heading back towards the, towards the wireless signal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll live and learn, folks, with the uh, with the talk and shop sessions. We'll make sure. Um, I, so I think I have to stay in this part of the building. Every time I go out there, I lose my connection. So I'll do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we had a question, John. Um, is there a prominent style of timber frame? This is a good question, actually. Is there a prominent style of timber frame out there in the Northwest? That's a good question. Um, yes, there is a prominent style of timber work. There is almost no timber framing. There is a lot of timber work and there is a lot of, uh, exposed wood and, and heavy wood framing. Um, there are almost, you know, you hardly ever see any, uh, knee braces or kind of traditional store, you know, we don't do capes, garrison, salt boxes, um, Every now and then we get a barn, but most of what we do is more modern, tend to be lower pitched roofs and flat and shed, shed style roofs. Um, so most of it is, is more modern, you know, lots of glass, lots of stone, um, and lots of big timber. And people are, uh, they're spent, you know, VG, VG fur is so common and popular around here that it's, one of the biggest challenges for us is explaining uh, why there are knots. And look, and, and anyway, I mean, look, look at this material. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? it's absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> and it's still, and then they might be like, now, why, why are there all those knots in that? Like, because it's a tree. It was a tree. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> a, 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 good fr a, a good friend of mine, Ben Broomgraber, would say, hey, a tree's got to make a living too. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's on the call. So, yeah. Um, otherwise, I would I wouldn't have attributed it to him. Um, but um, the uh, I'm sorry. Is, is I thought I saw a question from Todd. And now I don't know what. Oh, there it is. Are the timbers as far as after dry drying or before drying? Um, they go into the kiln oversized rough, and then and Keith is the one who could probably answer all these questions if he's still on the call. They go into the kiln oversized rough, and then they're resawn straightened and um, then go through a four-sided planer. Okay. Yep. Um, is, is there a standard size depth width for the kerfing? In other words, how do you decide to make that kerf? Well, if I would walk out there and look and show you, but, but the, so the kerf, you're really trying to get to the heart. And again, Keith uh, will probably give you a more, a better technical explanation about this than I am. But so the kerfs are not all in the same location on all these these beams are you know all kind of the same but they're they're moved like on this one you can see the kerf is to this side and on this one the kerf is to this side and i think it's just trying to get them as close to the heart as possible and i don't know what machine they're using to do this with maybe the hundegger it looks like a hundegger saw blade keith you want to you want to unmute and tell us we actually have a, a circular saw that sits on our saw bed that we can run down the length of the piece, basically from the side. Okay. And, cool. and John, it looks like there's still a bit of splay. I imagine that's because yep. um, because of the drying is not um, complete. Yeah, not on the stuff that this this big. So we'll clean that up when we when we uh, when we finish these this these pieces haven't been finished. Yet. These are posts. I think eleven by twenty one. 20s and we haven't cut these two posts yet and but we'll clean that up and flatten it off when we when we do the fab work and and if you hadn't dried it it'd be a lot more movement a lot of checking yeah. a lot more movement and yeah. a lot of splaying going on for sure um yeah the, is um 
<laughs> John Walker asks a really uh, interesting question for us, John, here. Um, is anyone asking about CLT construction in conjunction with timber framing? Um, yeah, cross, cross laminated so, timber. For those of folks who don't know what CLTs are, cross laminated timber. So all the cross, there's, there's an architect in Seattle whose name escapes me uh, right now who has built a home, her own home um, out of CLTs, but uh, it's a challenge to use CLT in residential construction. Well, we see a lot of uh, commercial work uh, with CLTs and timber. We do a fair amount of glue lamb work. Um, we, we're equal opportunity timber guys so we work in glue lamb and in solid sawn um and we've we've got a couple of jobs bid right now we haven't actually ever in, installed any clts but we got one job that i think is going to close we've given a verbal uh with it. we've been selected but the contract hasn't been awarded for an addition to a private school that's going to have some clt in it and that'll that'll start uh, sometime the end of this year and then we've uh, bid a couple other jobs that are more we're just bidding one that's uh actually it's a mid-rise seven stories it's four stories of of framing with clt um so but it's more common in commercial um than, you know commercial or like we did a big y, ywca roof um or, or ymca roof with a bunch of glue lambs in it that had the, the big glue lambs that we got or for uh, yellow cedar glue lambs were 12 and a half inches, 12 and a quarter inches wide, 98 inches deep and 94 feet long. Um, so we do a lot of, a lot of that kind of thing. John, why, why, why did you mention, you know, why did, why do you say that um, uh, you don't think that it's, it's tough? You don't find a lot of CLTs in residential. Why do you think that is? What's, what's your opinion? Well, you know, so it's, I don't think it's very cost effective. I mean, unless you, you know, how running all your utilities and everything is, is challenging. Um, CLT really kind of pays when it's run, making big spans, um, you know, and I, no, I just haven't seen a set of plans come through with any CL, residential CLT work in it. And typically we don't use structural insulated panel on the walls because most residences in the in the Pacific Northwest have a lot of glass um, and so typically um, structural insulated panel walls don't pencil out they, we end up you having a conventionally framed wall um, and a sip roof and then you have the timbers that carry the gravity loading in the interior um, and you know all of the laterals are pushed into the into the shear walls Makes sense. Other questions for John? Well, at the top, at the top of when John started, he 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 was mentioning something that that um, really kind of um, almost uh, protected me there, and that was because I'd only asked John to do this uh, with very short notice. So um, I, I have a personal thank you uh, to John to. Uh, for for pulling together this and in, in such short on such short notice, but um, he, he's one of those go-to guys. You can you can generally uh, expect that John's going to perform. So um, I'd, I'd like to say thank you very much to you, John, for saving my bacon and help me out there. I like your no shirt, problem. by the way, Cascade Joinery <laughs> sign there. So, yeah. Yeah. There you go. So, yeah. All right. All right. Well, it's my yeah. pleasure. Yeah. It's a beautiful part of the world that you live in out there, John. Unbelievable. Yeah, Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Y'all all have a nice evening. You too, John. Nice Let's job. Bye, y'all. Bye. <laughs> we are gonna have another um we are gonna have another talk and shop. I think it's July eighth. You can check it out on weekly guild notes. July eighth, we're gonna go up to uh, Garland Mills. And we're going to, um, it'll be a longer tour. So we're just going to have uh, Dana Southworth give us a tour. He's out there practicing already. Um, so so uh, uh, that'll be on July 8th. But we also have some uh, upcoming uh, sessions. One of them with uh, Ben Brungraber, who's on the call today. Um, he's going to be talking about heavy timber trusses. 
That'll probably be a good one. I don't know. I'm just guessing. I'm thinking that'll probably be a good one. <laughs> so, so you might want to you might want to catch that. And and then also we're going to have an ATP. Uh, we're going to have a second ATP session um, in the upcoming week. So keep an eye out on that. We'd like to have um, people um, join us to discuss how they feel about the ATP. Uh, there's we focused with on the journey workers, and there was a lot of support. To, and and uh, people cooperated very well to, to focus on the journey workers and the apprentices. Really appreciate that. Um, but now we're going to be opening up the floor to to anybody that, that has something that they'd like to say about that apprenticeship training program that's coming up. I'm sorry, uh, that, that's coming up um, in, um, in, in, in the next couple of weeks. So take a look at that. And uh, Dick Schmidt has agreed today to uh, speak on, on, um, on knots, on the sizes of knots. And that's going to be a really, I think, interesting eye-opening session because they're not as big as you think they are. And, and so that's going to be something that's really helpful for timber framers, particularly the ones that are using um, ungraded timbers so that you can uh, use your timber more effectively. So um, please do join us in the future. Um, we're, uh, we're, looking, uh, we're looking forward to having you. We had um, up to 60 people here tonight. Um, so that's great. Um, we haven't hit our limit of 100, though, but one of these days we will. So, so, so thanks, folks, and we'll see you in the we'll see you in the next one.